the middle of the 20th century, the United Kingdom was a very different place. Murder in cold blood, and there's a good chance he'll soon be visited by the executioner. This is where some of the world's most controversial murderers have one thing in common. They all had an appointment with the one man they prayed they would never meet. Up until 1965, the death penalty was the prescribed sentence for premeditated murder. And when the courts demanded a life for a life, he handed it out in abundance. He even flew by private plane to Germany where the Belsen war criminals were waiting for him, and he executed them all. They all died by his hand. Executioner. And the prisoner is escorted out of the condemned cell into the execution chamber and is placed on a white chalk mark so that his feet are across the division of the trap. While my assistant is fastening up his legs, I draw a white cap over his head and place a noose round his neck. A dedicated, complete professional who knew his craft totally. It was a job. He was a professional. He did the job and went home, carried on with his life. As soon as I see that everything is ready, I pull the lever and the prisoner falls through it. And it is all over in an instant. He was shy of meeting the wrong sort of people who might embarrass him about his occupation. He had the professional ability to separate out his work and the horror of his days uh, from his home life. He should be put in jail as well and tried for killing people. Albert Pierpoint was the country's official executioner between 1932 and 1956. During this time, he hanged a record number of people, but the exact number of men and women he has sent to the gallows remains a closely guarded secret to this day. As well as telling the incredible story of his life and the story of the notorious people he hung, we will reveal this figure on television for the very first time. Most people have got a preconceived idea of what a, an executioner looks like. Uh, and it's based from old films and cartoons, etc. And it's usually a very large guy who perspires and who's unshaven and wears a leather helmet, uh, black tights uh, and an apron. And when Albert came in, he, he was wearing a, a single-breasted raincoat and a brown trilby. A dapper man he was. He was always very, very well dressed. You never saw Albert without a tie on. He always um, wore a suit, very much um, a gentleman. He was really a very, very nice person. He was a man easy to get on with and very jovial. He was always singing, telling little anecdotes, funny anecdotes and, and jokes. We went out a lot together. He was a season ticket holder at Southport Football Club. They asked me if I was interested and I, I, I told him that I was, that I was a regular tender. And from then on, I used to go with him and sit in the stand at Southport Football Club. Albert wasn't the first peer point to adopt this rather macabre profession. The dynasty started in 1901 when his father Henry applied to the Home Office and received an invitation to train as an executioner in return. By 1906, he'd encouraged his elder brother Thomas to officially register his interest, and shortly the two siblings were travelling to prisons across the country to carry out their duties. But it was young Albert who had proved to be the most prolific of the trio. I think I've got a dual personality. When I've been away somewhere, I can come home and I can completely forget all about it until somebody brings it up. And there's always somebody asking you a question, what's this about this? Dual personality. It's possible, or maybe he was relying on a higher power to clear his conscience at the end of the day. I think he was fairly religious because he told me that he believed it was intended that this was the job that he should do. He reckons he was just an ordinary man who did everything like that. It was his job. And I said to him, no, it wasn't. So I said, you could have stopped and said, I'm not doing it. He said, well, then they've got another chap who'll do it. So I might as well do it. I couldn't really go along with the fact that he'd been almost directed by God to do this. Uh, I think he believed it. 
and it probably helped him in justifying what he did. But how many others before him needed to justify what they did as a profession? Capital punishment and torture was then commonplace throughout the British Isles, and still is in many parts of the world to this day. Throughout the centuries, thousands of people have had the ominous role of pulling the lever, swinging the axe, and lowering the flaming torch responsible for burning criminals at the stake. In history, the word execution was once synonymous with torture. Quite simply, um, it was seen as a means of displaying to the public, inciting fear in a public, and to some degree, entertaining the public when executions were public. When we talk about examples of early execution methods, people think of the more familiar, um, horrendous, uh, the hanging, drawing and quartering of an individual and possibly the gibbeting of the remnants uh, of that individual as well. Uh, these were in fact horrific spectacles for the public. One of the more horrendous forms of execution would be the sawing in half of an individual, particularly upside down, hanging them by the legs and cutting from the crotch downwards because the blood runs to the head and keeps you alive as long as possible. Hanging as an execution began very similar to other horrendous forms of execution as a public spectacle, as a means of entertaining people on a day out, as many as 50,000 people may turn up to watch the hanging. Hanging itself was primitive, pushing them off ladders, off the backs of carts, these people um, strangle to death, often fairly slowly and horrendously in front of the public. As this process was instigated over many centuries, changes began to appear. I used to think it was barbaric, and I've used the word barbaric myself, but I think I should use the word antiquated. I think that's a, a better word for it, because, like I've said, uh, you, you don't get many scenes at an execution, you don't get into trouble. But in your mind, it sounds barbaric. Occasionally, a case would surface where it seemed only a barbaric solution would suffice. A case so horrific that it would instill horror and fear into the minds of men, women and children alike. Pierpoint would preside over some of the most controversial executions of the 20th century. Some of these would help to change the country's attitude to his profession. One such controversy would follow the gruesome events at 10 Rillington Place. It was there that John Christie slaughtered and raped several women and hid the bodies in and around his house. One of these women was the wife of his upstairs neighbor, Timothy Evans. He also murdered their young baby, Geraldine. The unlucky Evans was wrongly accused and aided by his neighbor, Christie's false testimony, was eventually found guilty of these two murders and sentenced to death. Pierpoint was invited to perform Evans's execution and, unknown to him at the time, sent an innocent man to his death. Being educationally um, limited, Evans was easily persuaded um, by various points of view, including Christie's and including the police. Christie had also suggested to him that it would be a crime for both Christie and him to be involved in this. Therefore, let us cut our differences, as it were, and let himself, Christie, off the hook and let Evans carry the whole can. It was three years after Pierpoint executed Timothy Evans in 1950 that the real killer, Christie, was uncovered. Christie was um, basically somebody who was um, s discovering himself as, as something of a sexual sadist and only found his sort of escape into power when he realised that he felt powerful in the presence of dead bodies, uh, particularly ones that he created himself, which he went on to do uh, later in his life. He used uh, the guise of being a friendly doctor uh, and the administration uh, of sort of poisons uh, as a means to almost kill someone uh, and make it look as though um, he was just simply carrying out some kind of medical job. Three years after Evans' wrongful execution, Pierpoint received another request from the Home Office, this time to hang the real killer, Christie. Christie was only caught after new residents moved into the notorious 10 Rillington Place. They complained of strange smells coming from certain parts of the house, and when the police investigated, they discovered body parts hidden in a blocked-up pantry. 10 Rillington Place and the surrounding area has been demolished with only this memorial garden in northwest London remaining. But this horror story will not be forgotten for many years to come. He was a prolific killer, and he was a stealthy and silent killer who is very hard to detect. 
Pierpoint was also summoned to the execution of the acid bath murderer John George Haig, who dissolved his victims in barrels of acid, and James Inglis, who had the infamous record of being the fastest man ever to go to the gallows, from cell to rope, in only seven seconds. But would Albert ever turn up to an execution with prior knowledge of the person soon to stand before him? Would he worry whether he was hanging an innocent person, or would he be content in the knowledge that he was removing a corrupt and cold-blooded murderer from society? He wouldn't get involved by reading about the, uh, the trials of these individuals or anything like that. He would avoid reading them. So he never really got an opinion as to whether that person, you know, had, um, had committed the crime or otherwise. I don't believe he ever went home from an execution and had second thoughts as to whether it was right or proper or anything like that. One hanging that is widely considered to be anything but right or proper is that of Derek Bentley in 1953, Pierpoint's most controversial hanging. The case of Derek Bentley uh, is intriguing because this man would clearly possibly be seen to be innocent even at the time. This isn't one where law has subsequently changed. Bentley and his friend were breaking into a warehouse but were cornered on the roof by the police. As Bentley himself was arrested, he called to his friend, let him have it. It was just these four words that sent Bentley to the gallows. But had he really been urging his friend to open fire on the police or was he telling him to hand over his pistol? All the police could really pin on Bentley was the idea that he may have encouraged his friend to shoot someone um, by simply saying, let him have it. And this became a catchphrase hanging over the case. It may be that Derek Bentley, even at the age of 19, a young chap, uh, went to the gallows uh, as punishment because his colleague was too young to hang. Bentley being hung as an innocent it would have filtered through to Pierpoint uh, and he would have been aware of the weakness of this conviction. The finality uh, and the sort of irrevocability of the death penalty is, uh, is illustrated amply by uh, the Bentley, uh, Christie, Haig cases and should leave big question marks around the suitability of such a such a sentence. But should the executioner be judged for simply pulling the lever? In Albert Pierpoint's case, he saw himself as just one man, a man who wouldn't even stand out in the crowd, a man who believed he had an important role in society, which should be carried out in the most professional and courteous manner. After the break, we find out a little more about some of Albert's predecessors and hear about one occasion where things went horribly wrong. We've heard how Albert Pierpoint got the invitation to hang some of Britain's most controversial criminals, but why would this seemingly gentle and friendly individual choose such a macabre and secretive profession? Our teacher, he asked the class to do an essay on what would they like to be when they left school. And the first thoughts that came in my head was I would like to be an executioner. So we sat down and we started writing this essay, and our teacher he came round the class and he, he looked over the boy's shoulders and he came to me and looked over my shoulder and he, he just looked up and he smiled. That was, uh, I think, the first feeling I had about being an executioner. Albert wanted to be an executioner because he thought so much of his uncle and his father before him. In doing so, I think he wanted to perfect the profession to a higher degree than had been in the past and worked on that. He knew by this time that his father had been a hangman and he knew that his uncle was also a hangman. But he had read his father's memoirs, he'd read his father's papers and correspondence and he totally immersed himself in the subject. He knew pretty much everything about the job from what his father had recorded. Henry trained Thomas, his elder brother, in the role and encouraged him to apply to the Home Office initially for the position of assistant hangman. He was quickly accepted onto the official list of qualified hangmen and started to accompany his brother to his official business. It was Henry Pierpoint who began the family's role in being executioners for the Crown. But um, his psychological profile was not of someone who was robust and could separate out um, the actual day job uh, from his home life. And he unfortunately did uh, get rather enmeshed with alcohol as a result of this, which led to his downfall. In July 1910, Henry Pierpoint went to Chelmsford Prison in Essex to carry out an execution. He arrived at the prison smelling of drink. He was shown into the governor's office where John Elliott, his assistant, was already waiting. 
They had words, they started to fight, Pierpont punched Ellis in the face, they were separated, taken to their quarters. The execution was carried out satisfactorily, no problems there. The following day, Ellis went home, wrote a letter to the Home Secretary, and Pierpont was sacked. Thomas was possibly better attuned to this job and proved himself as being a fairly good technician uh, and it led the family almost to be in competition with others who saw themselves as technically good at hanging. Since the abolition of public hanging in 1868, there had been numerous applications for the role of chief executioner. William Calcraft oversaw the transition from public to private executions, but still carried out his duties in a barbaric fashion, and the condemned would take many minutes to strangle to death at the end of the rope. William Marwood was the next high-profile executioner and was widely praised for his professional attitude to the job. Marwood, as a hangman, uh, made one of the, the biggest um, sort of advances in terms of um, converting what, in fact, was a public um, spectacle as propounded by uh, Calcraft in strangling people for the public um, entertainment into a process of humane execution. Marwood introduced the long drop. Quite simply, that means transforming uh, someone dangling from a rope until they strangled to death into dropping them so their neck broke and they died fairly quickly. Marwood's successor was the ill-fated James Berry. He was credited for calculating a proper table of drops, changing the length of the rope according to the height, weight and size of the condemned, but this led to one very unfortunate instance. After calculating a certain drop for a prisoner who was in poor physical condition, he got his measurements wrong. On pulling the lever, the condemned man, Robert Goodall, was decapitated by the sheer force of the drop. Albert Pierpoint grew up in the back streets of Clayton in Bradford, and after moving to Failsworth in Manchester at the age of 12, he began to dream of a life as the chief executioner of Britain, just like his father Henry before him. Henry Pierpoint would sit in the clogger's arms, the pub at the end of their road, and tell his executioner tales to the locals, whilst drinking away the profits of his second career. By the time Albert was 17, his father had died, leaving his family to fend for themselves and Albert to find some full-time employment. Before Albert was an executioner, he was a delivery man for a confectionery firm, a wholesale grocers, actually. Starting off driving with a horse and carts, and then he progressed on to driving a lorry, and he did that job until 1946. Albert's family was very important to him, none more so than his older brother, John, whom he spent a great deal of time with. Uncle Albert was um, Grandad's brother. The relationship that Grandad had had with Uncle Albert growing up as children was, it was probably quite a difficult one at times because when he was growing up, he um, was the one who was perhaps left behind when his dad and his uncle um, went away and saw the effect on his mother and he, he deeply loved his mother. When Uncle Albert chose to go and follow in his dad's and his uncle's footsteps, then that was a real conflict for my, for my granddad because he didn't want to, to see that pain carry, carrying on um, of everything that, that went with being a peer point. His role as executioner would always have a sombre effect on his immediate family. Because of this, Albert kept his professional and personal lives strictly separate. He preferred to forget all about his second career as soon as he left the prison gates after an execution. The reason for people wanting the role of public executioner may have initially been a bit of fame, a bit of infamy, a bit of purpose in your life, and also some remuneration uh, for a fairly low-skilled job at the end of the day. At the peak of Albert's career in the early 50s, an official executioner could expect to earn £15 per neck. But when he initially applied to the Home Office for the role of assistant executioner, he would only expect a meagre £2.02. Two shillings. There was always around six executioners on the official Home Office register, including two chief and four assistants. But it would soon become obvious that no other individual could match Albert's expertise and professionalism. His character fitted the role exactly. He was dutiful, he was obsessive, he was precise as a technician, and he felt that he had a role to play which was functional and helpful in society in making it a humane end for whoever it was that he stirred in the eyes for the last time. 
The tools of a hangman's trade were a collection of ropes, straps and thread, and Albert was completely comfortable in their presence. He went behind the settee and brought out a case and op opened the case, and it contained all the paraphernalia of his execution uh, tools, ropes, uh, strands of wire and cotton thread. And he explained to me, just on that one occasion, what they were all used for. The execution box arrived the day before and would be dealt with by the hangman himself. He would take out the two nooses and the hood and the shackles. The shackles were supplied to pinion the hands and feet. Copper wire was attached to the rope to monitor any movement or stretching overnight. Chalk for marking the position of the feet, cotton thread to hold the noose in place at the height of the prisoner's head, and then there's the rope. It was about 13 foot long and woven into one end was like a brass washer which was used to fasten the rope to the chain. The other end was threaded into a noose through like a, a brass pear-shaped eye hole which was sewn into the rope. The bottom part of the noose was uh, covered in like a soft leather which was really to stop any burn marks on the prisoner's neck. I was in his house one day and he said to me, come and come into the back bedroom, I've got something I want to show you, you see. And we went into the back bedroom and he got out this suitcase. While we were talking in the room, he put the noose around my neck and he said, this is how it was done. And he said, in future years, you'll be able to tell people that you're the only person that ever walked away from Albert Pierpoint once he'd done this. Being an executioner came with a series of strict rules and regulations, and none more strict than the process of hanging itself. The entire procedure was carried out by the chief executioner and his assistant, and all credit or failure lay at their feet. The hangman and his assistant would arrive at the prison before four o'clock on the afternoon prior to the execution. They would be shown to the governor's office, they would be given the details of the prisoner, his height, his age, his weight, they would view the prisoner at exercise or in the condemned cell. They would then go down to the execution chamber, unpack the equipment which had been sent in an execution box. They would rig the gallows. They would fill a sandbag with weight, roughly the equivalent of the prisoner. They would fasten it to the rope and then in presence of the governor and the chief engineer, they would do a test drop to make sure all the mechanics were working perfectly. The rope would then be left to stretch overnight and the hangman and his assistant would go back to their quarters. On the actual day of the hanging, around seven o'clock, because most hangings were generally carried out around eight o'clock or nine o'clock, uh, the hangman would have his jobs of checking. He would have the noose ready, you know, the rope would be in position, and he would also check the trap door was functioning correctly and its lever and the pit safety pin were all in place and functional. Whilst final preparations go on outside the condemned cell, inside the prisoner, accompanied by two warders and a priest, if requested, contemplates the last minutes of his life before his scheduled execution. At a few minutes to the appointed hour, the hangman and his assistant would be escorted to the condemned cell. They would wait outside the cell door until they got a signal from the governor. At that point, um, everything that follows was in the hands of the hangman. In the condemned cell was a wardrobe. The wardrobe was pushed aside and there was an opening through to the execution chamber. And the, once the wardrobe was moved, Albert came in. The prisoner would normally be sat with his back to the door at a table. He would get to his feet, the assistant would help the hangman to strap his hands behind his back. And as he said, I lined the straps with suede so that there was no chance that you would pinch his skin and break his concentration. He said the floor, you had no steps, the floor was totally smooth so that he couldn't catch his toe. Ten paces and they're onto the trap door. The assistant would drop down to his knees, secure the man's ankles while the hangman took a white bag from his pocket, put it over his head, placed the noose, adjusted it, stepped back. Went for the lever, sprang the trap. Which would release the trap door, uh, allowing the condemned to drop fairly swiftly, which would ensure the severing of the spinal cord instant unconsciousness and very rapid death indeed. He said, and from me entering that cell to him being dead was 15 seconds. Whatever might be said about, uh, about executioners, and there are those that are hostile, is that they're doing their duty, but they're doing it with as much dignity as possible. He considered hanging was the most humane method of execution that there was. He said, I've witnessed them all. 
He said, I've seen shootings, I've seen the electric chair, I've seen gassings. He said, and they're all terrible in comparison. He said, it's the cleanest and the quickest of all. Um, and he said that on occasions when I've been on holiday, if there's an execution, I'll go and see it. In part three, the Nazi war criminals are sentenced to death. An executioner, Pierpoint, receives an invitation to Germany. Later, we also hear from the sister of Ruth Ellis, the last woman to be hanged in Britain. Was this the final nail in the coffin for Albert's career? A question that is often posed to um, within the death penalty debate is that if you uh, knew what, uh, what Hitler was going to do, then would it have been appropriate to have um, executed him? After learning his trade and perfecting every element of an execution, Albert was about to face his biggest challenge ever. His uncle Tom was only a year away from his last ever execution and had been removed from the title of number one executioner many years earlier in favour of his younger, more efficient nephew. As the Second World War ended, a new historic role beckoned. Albert was chosen to go over to Germany at the time because of his professionalism. I believe that concerns were that some of the executions being carried out by other nations. There was worries about them, and I think Albert's professionalism was known. I think he was promoted in as so much that he was, he'd been invited, or he got to meet uh, Field Marshal Montgomery. It was at his request that Britain supplied a hangman, but there was nobody else available. It wasn't purely, I want Albert Pierpoint, because of who he is, it was, I want our chief hangman. Albert's task was to execute the Nazis responsible for the deaths of tens of thousands of prisoners at the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp. Towards the end of the war, suspicions of genocide organised by the Nazi regime had been proven. At the Belsen camp, British forces were responsible for bringing justice to those found responsible. As all the horrors of the Holocaust were revealed to the world, so was Hitler's policy, and it was alarmingly simple. His deputies had the job of isolating supposedly inferior communities, including the Jewish, homosexuals, and people with mental illness, and ultimately dealt with them by elimination. They rounded them up and placed them in camps. There they were tortured, literally worked to death as slave labor, or in many cases, simply murdered en masse. People were given the job of both orchestrating, organising and eventually carrying out these rather sordid uh, and, and degenerate tasks. Uh, people like Kramer had the job of overseeing this. Kramer, who was more of a kind of um, aloof, autistic -y type person, he, he's a very strange character. He, he was a commandant of, of Belsen and, and he, he learned his, his ropes at uh, Auschwitz um, and, and oversaw most of the heinous crimes uh, and would give authority to most of the heinous crimes. He was a very strange character upon being caught in that he would wander around and show um, the invading army, the liberating army, what it had done and the places that they were done in, as if he hadn't done anything wrong at all. He just obeying orders and this is how it was done, etc. Whereas Kramer was thought of as the beast of Belsen, um, Emma Grace was thought of as the beauty of Belsen probably the nymphomaniac of Belson, a sexual psychopath. She um, indulged almost in um, rather bizarre sexual practices uh, using the, the inmates. Um, she, she would wear boots and a whip and she would use that kind of authority um, and in, a, in a disgraceful way. She added a very sordid element uh, to the whole process. Um, her activities um, would lead her ultimately to be the youngest female ever hung under British rule. On the 13th of December, 1945, Pierpoint executed 13 Nazi war criminals, 11 of them directly responsible for Holocaust crimes in the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp. 13 murderers on the 13th of December, but only 12 coffins were prepared. The last one had been overlooked and had to be buried wrapped in hessian in the prison grounds. Still a more dignified burial than they had given thousands of other human beings in the preceding years. But Albert did not get to hang them all. The Nuremberg war criminals were dealt with by the Americans. He went out to Germany to hang Ribbentrop and Goering and those, and was sent back. Uh, it went to the American. And the American had never hung anybody. He was an electric chairman and uh, made apparently a terrible mess of it. Uh, 
He didn't make the trap big enough. I heard that Julius Stryker, the Jew baiter, uh, lost the front of his face when he went down through the trap. The Americans carried out their executions of the high profile Nazi leaders and they were botched. There was cases of people not being hanged correctly and the whole thing was sort of quite messy. Albert, you know, ensured that within 15 seconds of meeting him, it was over. An executioner's wage was never enough to live off as a sole profession, and in the years after the war, Albert left his full-time job as a delivery man and took up the license of a public house just outside Manchester. The pub was ominously titled Help the Poor Struggler and would prove to be a successful venture as customers came from miles away to catch a glimpse of the famous executioner. Albert enjoyed his, his life as a publican because he was the sort of person that enjoyed company. He always enjoyed being in the company of others, where he could uh, talk to them, enjoy telling stories, singing, and, uh, and he was a very much a, a social character in that respect. Being a publican gave him the independence to be his own boss. It allowed him to take time off work to carry out an execution without having to report to anybody else. His professional career, as opposed to being uh, the landlord of a pub, were totally separated and there's no way that he would have um, engaged in any conversations with anyone in the pub or, I don't think, privately after an execution. He had found from experience that young people uh, didn't drink very well or hold the liquor very well, and he came up with a scheme uh, to keep everything tidy and not lose business. And the drink in those days for the young ladies was gin and tonic. And when Albert knew there were coaches coming, he filled two or three trays with gin, stood all the ladies' glasses upside down in the gin, filled his gin bottles with tonic, and when they all asked for gin and tonic, they got a glass out of the gin tray under the gin bottle full of tonic, put it on the counter. He said the girls used to say, oh, this gin's strong. They never got drunk, there was never any trouble, and he put all the gin back in the bottles when he finished. Totally unlawful, totally illegal, but he did it. Albert ran the pub with the help of his wife Anne, a quiet individual who would stay behind the scenes as much as possible and let Albert enjoy the spotlight. Anne was a quiet lady. She was very much in the shadow or background of Albert because of Albert's personality, which was outgoing. Uh, Anne was a much quieter lady. Anne, Albert's wife, was a lovely person. She had been a nurse. Albert and Anne were, were very fond of each other and spent a great deal of time together. They enjoyed their garden, they both worked at it and they enjoyed their home. They were very, very close to each other. Albert was the man of the house and Anne did the cooking and the baking and the shopping and generally took on her wifely duties. Uncle Albert was much more approachable, much more with his arms open wide, whereas Auntie Anne was more... Um, a bit more stern with me, maybe, I don't know. She was a little bit more intimidating, I think, as, yeah. as from a child's perspective. It wasn't where you could just run up and just go and look for things or sit, you know, sit on a knee and have a cuddle, where yeah. you could do with Uncle Albert. Maybe Anne's slightly more reserved attitude to life meant that she could live with being the hangman's wife on a daily basis. But was it true that they never spoke about his controversial profession? I think Anne always knew that Albert had had this peculiar second job, um, and she had learned to live with it. But it was something, as far as I'm aware, that they never discussed at all. He received uh, someone to go to London to fly out to Gibraltar to hang two spies, two saboteurs, and because of the secrecy involved, he didn't have time to tell his wife where he was going, he just disappeared. When he came back, he told her what he'd done and basically said she knew the fact that she'd been courting somebody called Pierpoint for 10 years and he disappeared every couple of weeks with a clean shirt. Must have surely um, caused some suspicion. Albus and Anne held a special place in their hearts for children. They would jump at the chance to spend time with those of their friends and relatives. Albert loved children, although unfortunately they never had any children. They would have been ideal parents, but uh, there were no children. I think that's what gave them a more social attitude. He had a pony, Albert, at one time, called Trio. And I know my two girls used to regularly go with Anne and Albert for rides on this pony. It was a real sadness then that they didn't have um, children. And um, I think they desperately wanted children. They looked at 
different ways that they could actually bring a child into their life. And I do know that from conversations that I've had with, you know, my mum or within the family that they would have liked to have um, had my mum as their um, child. My nan, my mum's mum, you know, felt desperately sad for them. Of course she did. You know, that was her family, that was her sister-in-law. I think they were that desperate for children that they even spoke to my grandparents about having... Um, Mum. Uh, having mum, as if, if they give her up and then if they could, they could take care of her. Coming up, a controversial end to his career and the widely criticised execution of Ruth Ellis for the cold-blooded murder of her boyfriend. Times were changing and public revolt against capital punishment was starting to hit the headlines. The Second World War had made a hero of one fortunate Yorkshireman named Pierpoint, who just happened to be the chief executioner. But gone were the days of revenge and hero status. Justice itself was in the dock, and in 1949, Parliament replied by commissioning a special report into executions in an effort to calm the general public. The Royal Commission of 4953 was set up really as a distraction in order to distract people away from abolition because the bill to abolish the death penalty had on several occasions been through the House of Commons and been knocked back in the House of Lords. They looked at the issue of changing our mode of execution. They actually did consider um, moving away from hanging. Against his will, Albert was summoned to appear before the commission to speak of his duties for the very first time. He did have a conversation, Albert, once about the Royal Commission with me and felt that he shouldn't have been required to give the information which he had to give to the Royal Commission under oath. He was covered by the Official Secrets Act at the time and I think he felt that uh, the pressure on him was too great and, uh, and he wasn't very happy about having to give this information to the Royal Commission. Albert said that he didn't like to talk about what he'd done but the thing he was most concerned about was having to give a figure of how many people he'd hanged. I don't think he was too much bothered about giving information although what I think what he took exception to the fact that what a lot of stuff he'd been told during his training was confidential and he'd stuck to that confidentiality. He'd refused to talk about it for 20 years. It will never be known whether the outcome of the Royal Commission would have been different if it had taken place after the execution of one Ruth Ellis. Convicted and sent to death for the cold-blooded murder of her boyfriend, David Blakely, in 1955. One night, Ellis took a gun to the pub where Blakely was drinking with friends, the Magdala in North London, and shot him five times. The bullet holes can still be seen in the wall of the pub to this day. The public revolted against her hanging, and questions were raised as to whether the family of the condemned should also have to suffer this life sentence of grief. Always think about Ruth. She's there, over there, look, behind you. She'll never be forgotten. She was a beautiful girl, and that's her own hair, because we were both dark, gingery hair we had. What happened to Ruth? That turned us all upside down, you know. You didn't know which way to walk when you, when it, when you knew, you know. You, could, you thought, go there, and, and you don't want to go there, so you want to go there, and just to walk away from it all the time. One which attracted, I think, the most attention was the execution of Ruth Ellis. Uh, a lot of people were against her being executed and crying out for her to be reprieved. Uh, I don't see why, under the circumstances, and knowing the circumstances of the case. Albert Pierpoint executed Ruth Ellis on the 13th of July, 1955, at Holloway Prison in London. Her death provoked a public outcry. At the time of the murder, David Blakely was subjecting Ellis to domestic violence, and it was widely believed that she murdered him whilst not being of a sound mind. The fact that she was also a beautiful 28-year-old socialite made her case that much more prominent, but apparently one man was not phased by this. I don't believe Albert was affected by the execution of Ruth Ellis, although there was a lot of media pressure at the time about executions of women in particular. I never thought that she'd go, she'd be hung. Never. There was nothing I could do about her. I, I would have done it. I would have put myself in her place if I could have done. Unfortunately for a hangman, placing a rope around a female neck probably 
creates more revulsion than placing it around a male neck. I've seen some very brave men die, and believe me, Ruth Ellis was as brave as any brave man had died. But after her death, Pierpoint wrote numerous letters to Ruth's sister, Muriel Jackie Bates. Had he overstepped the mark by contacting the family of one of his appointments? I had letters from Pierpoint. He was writing to me. He wanted to find me and talk to me, and he did. And then from there, we went to Ruth's grave, all the way back out to Amersham. I wasn't interested in him. Because what he, he he just hung my sister. How can I be nice to him? I put some flowers on there, and then he said, "Would you all go for a walk?" Because he wanted to be on his own. Albert Pierpoint never made a habit of contacting any of his victims' families, but this was different. One of his letters talks about his desire to visit Ruth's grave, but for what reason? Would you mind if a friend and myself came to take a picture of me? standing at the graveyard, and that's what he did do. That reminds me, watching him now, he was kneeling on his knees beside Ruth's grave. He was, he was really praying that he had, really, Ruth was on his mind all the time, and he was thinking about Ruth's children as well. I think that's what it is trying to, to get to the Lord, as they say. Pierpoint wrote numerous letters to Muriel in the late 70s, one of which revealed the truth about the last seconds of her sister's life in a haunting confession. One thing I do remember, and have never mentioned this to a soul, as I was the last person to see her face to face. She just puckered her lips as though she wanted to smile. In the last few seconds we had, I painfully accepted her smile. Albert only carried out two more executions after the hanging of Ruth Ellis in 1955, and his retirement was imminent. But just what was the reason for him wanting to put this controversial career behind him? I don't believe that the execution of Ruth Ellis influenced him at all in his decision to resign. I think there are other forces which, which influenced him. He did tell me that he had had a dispute with the uh, government department which paid his expenses. Uh, he told me that there had been difficulties in times before when his expenses hadn't been paid on time. Albert retired because of an issue he'd had with the Home Office at the time over a, an execution that he'd been called to, which was cancelled. And I think he felt at that time he was treated unfairly. He then saw this as an insult because he was at the top of his profession. Um, he was a, a highly sought-after executioner uh, and to be treated in this way really hit him where it counted in his professional status and his professional pride. Albert Pierpoint retired after a dispute over expenses but he'd also just signed an agreement with the Sunday newspaper to reveal his memoirs and part of that deal would be that he wouldn't be able to be a hangman. On retirement, Albert refused to tell his friends and family exactly how many people he hanged over his 24-year career. He even omitted the figure from his autobiography. Theories exist, but how true are they? There is a certain amount of speculation over the number of people that Albert Pierpoint dispensed with. On record, it is around 450, with 17 females and 433 males being in that count. He never told me, Albert, the number he'd, he'd executed. Uh, in conversations, he always maintained that it would be a number he would take to his grave. I only know that it was some hundreds, something over 400. It wasn't something that he wanted to be known as the most prolific hangsman or anything like that. He was not proud of the body count. He was proud of his ability, his technique. He did not beat his chest over numbers. For the first time ever, on television, we can reveal the exact figure of the number of people he dispatched. The true total of people like hanging by Albert Pierpoint is 435. In his capacity as assistant or chief executioner, Albert Pierpoint hanged exactly 435 people over 24 years in the job. From the research I've done, speaking to other hangmen, viewing other 
diaries and papers and official documentation, I know for a fact that Albert Pierpoint's participated in 435 executions. And if you look at copies of his diary, those figures are, are there. But one of the more shocking revelations is about Albert's complete change of heart to the career that once made him a household name. In the early 70s, he shocked the world with the revelation that he no longer believed in the effectiveness of capital punishment. Where once he prided himself on carrying out a just and proper service for the public, he revealed in his autobiography in 1974 that he now felt it had never been a real deterrent. In the years after publishing his book, he lived a quiet life in Southport, eventually residing in a nursing home. Albert died peacefully in his sleep on Friday the 10th of July, 1992. He was 87 years old. From being perhaps the greatest proponent of capital punishment, um, Albert will have realised, staring into the eyes of those individuals, slowly but surely, that he was not having the effect that he thought he had, that he was not changing these people, he was not changing society. And I think that dealt a final blow to Albert's position on capital punishment.